for today's uh, IBS PCS seminar. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have with us today on site uh, Professor Stefan Nimrichter from University of Siegen, uh, Germany. And I would like to invite our scientific host, Dario, to introduce our speaker. Please, Dario. Yeah, thanks, Dylan. So it's a great pleasure to have Stefan today with us. Actually, the entire week that he has been and will be together, will be with us until uh, tomorrow. So let me introduce a little bit his career. So he got his PhD in University of Vienna in 2013. Eh? And uh, his thesis was about macroscopic matter wave interferometry. After that, he had a couple of postdoc positions in Duisburg, for example, and then he spent three years in the Center for Quantum Technology in Singapore. Then in 2019, he went back to Germany at the Max Planck Institute for the Sense of, uh, for the Sense of Light, of light in Erlangen. And finally, starting from September 2020, is now currently a junior professor in theoretical quantum optics at Siegen. Now, um, Stefan is visiting us because we share many, let's say, interests uh, on quantum technologies in general, for example, quantum batteries that we also care. And uh, today, his talk is going to be about quantum thermometers, quantum batteries, and lesser demos. So probably it's time for me to shut up and ask our speaker to start. Stay. Yes, thanks a lot, Dax. And uh, thanks also for having me here and giving me the opportunity to give an overview of the, 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 the work that we are doing in my group in Siegen and also with many collaborators on quantum thermodynamics, specifically on something like, let's say, applications of the theory of thermodynamics in um, thermal devices, thermometers, batteries, and measurement-driven quantum engines, also known as maxwell demon engines, that I'm going to talk about. Now, the work that I'm going to present is done, well, with several people, uh, together with several people. So this is the group that I'm currently working in uh, at the University of Siegen. This is the theoretical quantum optics uh, division headed by Professor Otto Bühne here, that I'm part of, and the people marked with the red arrows, these are the people that um, I'm working with um, on topics of open quantum systems and quantum thermodynamics. In particular, there are several uh, students involved, Julia Bujans, Mei Yu, Salva Chagler, just finishing her master's uh, thesis, Michael Gaida is also a PhD student, Satoya Imai is also a PhD student, and then there are some postdocs and senior postdocs involved as well. But uh, actually, the majority of work that I'm going to present here was already done before in collaboration with others, in particular, former PhD student and postdoc from Singapore, Stella Sia, and a PhD student from Pisa, Rafael de Salvia, who was visiting um, one of my collaborating groups at the University of Geneva, the quantum theory group headed by Nicolas Bonner, Martin Perrano de Bay, and uh, Geraldine Haag. And there are a few other collaborators as well. Uh, from different places, including, for instance, Security Singapore. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is quantum thermodynamics. Now, quantum thermodynamics is a kind of a fashionable field at the moment, and there are several approaches to this field. One approach is a very fundamental approach, formal approach, trying to rephrase the laws and the concepts of thermodynamics in the language of quantum information theory, for example. And the other approach that I'm rather more focused on is a more pragmatic approach, is to try to take inspiration from good old textbook thermodynamics and the countless applications of textbook thermodynamics in matured everyday technologies such as car engines, thermometers, bridges, batteries, and so on, and try to build miniaturized quantum models that kind of do the same thing as the classical analogs and study their operation principle in the quantum regime using only elementary quantum degrees of freedom as our working medium for itself. And the kind of holy grail in that field, in a way, is to try to identify theoretically and then later demonstrate in proof of principle experiments something like genuine advantages of these quantum versions of engines that arise due to the presence of quantum resources that you wouldn't have in a classical category. However, one has to keep in mind that we are still at the stage of toy models and early proof of principle experiments. So actual applications, useful applications are still far away. Now, if you actually want to describe theoretically 
uh, these kind of systems and you want to study quantum thermal devices with open quantum systems, you actually need open quantum theory of, of well, thermodynamics. And the reason for that is that such small quantum systems typically operate in a regime that is far away from the regime that we, this idealized regime we use in conventional textbook thermodynamics, where we have a large working medium of many, many microscopic degrees of freedom. Fluctuations in that working medium are usually negligible. And we can, we can usually describe this medium in an equilibrium or close to an equilibrium state. This is far from being the case in quantum thermal devices, where we have small quantum systems that are continuously interacting at the same time at finite times with a structured environment composed of many, many influences. For instance, there can be heat input from a hot bath. There can be heat outflux to a cold bath. There can be an observer continuously monitoring the quantum system. And there can be a control agent that is switching on and off control pulses and changing parameters over time. All of this happens at the same time and rapidly, which means that the system that we're talking about, our working medium, will typically be driven far out of equilibrium and will fluctuate strongly. So this is really the opposite regime in a way from what we have in mind in conventional thermodynamics. So what we need is a framework of open quantum theory to describe these kinds of systems. There are different ways to do this. And one very popular framework at the moment is the framework of so-called collision models or repeated interaction models. And this is a kind of algorithmic and very, let's say, numerically favorable framework to describe arbitrarily complicated environments in terms of something like idealized scattering processes. So the idea of these frameworks is the following. We have an open quantum system with a state of interest row, and we want to describe some kind of environment. And we do this by compartmentalizing the environment into individual degrees of freedom that we describe by ancilla quantum systems, which can be prepared in some state Maybe it's a random ensemble stage, or it's something that we prepare deliberately. And we send these ancillas one by one past the system and let them interact with the system via some interaction Hamiltonian uh, over, let's say, a finite window of time. So we kind of switch on the interaction Hamiltonian, let them interact, switch it off, and let the ancilla pass until the next one arrives. Now, to make things a bit more interesting, we can, for instance, also start doing a quantum measurement on the ancillas after they have interacted with the system. And we can even provide a feedback operation to the system based on our measurement result to introduce something like a memory effect, for example, or just generally a feedback operation that can lead to all kinds of non-Markovian, um, let's say, open quantum dynamics with memory effects. Okay? But you can see this is a very flexible model. And we can design numerical algorithms by using the sequence of ancillas, measurements, and feedback operations to describe arbitrarily complicated environments because we can use multiple such streams to make it even more complicated. Sorry, just, just a trivia question that came out when, I, when we were working on, on similar things. When you want to do the measurement of the ancilla, am I right? Typically, what you do after the interaction, you will, let's say, trace out the qubit because you focus mm -hmm. on the system. To do the measurement, instead you have to do the measurement of the ancilla yes. before tracing down. Yeah, you cannot do this. Yes, okay. We will see an example. Mm -hmm. Now, as I've already said, this can be used as a blueprint for all kinds of environments. You can use this to mimic thermalization, so you can basically numerically describe thermalization processes, set standard Markovian thermalization, but you can also do work reservoirs, reservoirs with uh, other kind of quantum features, and so on and so forth. External control fields, you can mimic all this with these kinds of models. Then because it's already phrased in a discrete manner, you're doing one map after another in discrete steps, it's already kind of done, it's constructed in a way that you can directly implement it on your computer. That's also very practical. And you can also do adaptive protocols. You can start changing things as you go. For instance, you can adapt your measurement strategy as you acquire more information and so on. And third, the laws of thermodynamics are also well understood in this case because they have all been consistently formulated in these kinds of models. So all the laws of thermodynamics, we understand very well how they actually apply and, and how they look at how they look like in detail for these repeated interaction models. If you want to know about this, you should check the latest reviews on um, on these repeated interaction models. There's one big review here 
by Cicciarello et al., but there's also the works by Philip Strasberg and others who go into much detail about how these models work and how the laws of thermodynamics work. For instance, you have to account for the work associated to switching associated to switching on and off this interaction Hamiltonian. You have to account for the energy you provide to your feedback operation. You have to um, account for the information flow into the measurement device and so on and so forth. All right, but I don't want to actually uh, bore you with more technical details about methods to, to, to do, but I rather want to go now to the things that I actually want to talk about which is applications of these models and looking at how we can understand thermal devices in a quantum machine. So I'm going to talk about several example applications that we studied over the years. One is quantum thermometry, how to estimate temperature using quantum probes on a thermal environment, and how we can use non-equilibrium features to enhance sensitivity under certain circumstances. The second uh, application is quantum batteries, which is also something that uh, is, is done here. And um, I will show you um, a model in which we can use quantum coherence to boost the charging power of a quantum battery. And last but not least, I will talk about a more exotic um, um, topic, which is Maxwell's demon engines, which is basically an engine driven by quantum measurements. And we had a self-contained model that we studied where we use a mechanical pointer measurement to basically extract work from heat. All right. So let's start with the first application, quantum thermometry. What is quantum thermometry formally speaking? Well, it's essentially a metrology problem, a parameter estimation problem. We have one parameter that we don't know, which is the temperature of the bath. We can send in probes that interact with the bath. We get information by measuring these probes about the temperature, and we acquire information by repeating our measurements. And we ask, how accurate is our estimate? How accurate can our estimate of temperature be? given the measurement strategy that we do. That's basically a typical quantum parameter estimation problem. In our case, we are going to use this repeated interaction framework to describe a dynamical thermometer. So what we're doing is we have a bath with a temperature that we don't know, and we're going to send in a stream of ancillas that are probing the bath. Now let's remind ourselves how a normal thermometer works. Let's, let's see how this works. So we basically have a probe here. And what we typically do to measure temperature, we bring this probe into contact with a the thermal bath, for instance, the human body. And then we wait until the probe thermalizes with that bath. And then we measure the average energy of the probe, essentially. Yeah? So this is a standard conventional equilibrium thermometer, where we just wait until everything equilibrates, and then we measure. Now, what we do here, we are describing basically a steady flow scenario where we have a regular flow of ancillas. They are also probing a local contact system and are allowed to exchange energy with it. But this all happens at finite times. We do not wait until everything has fully thermalized. Instead, we have a certain rate at which we probe the system. And the task is now by collecting many of these ancillas to estimate the bath temperature from the measurement on these ancillas that we collect. So it's kind of a stroboscopic probing protocol of a local contact system. And it is not in equilibrium, but we will use this equilibrium as a benchmark because that's kind of a standard thermometer. Well, equilibrium in this case would mean that every ancilla is allowed to exchange as long as it wants energy with the bar until it's fully thermalized. And I will show you now in a simple model that actually this dynamical thermometer can beat the sensitivity of a standard thermometer under certain circumstances. All right, in the minimum model, to actually understand it, we can actually describe everything by qubits, okay? So the contact system shall be a qubit, and all the ancillas we prepare shall also be qubits. Okay? And that, if, if we have qubits, of course, we can, in principle, draw something like a circuit diagram, a quantum circuit that describes our protocol. Okay? In this case, it looks like this. We have the system qubit that undergoes two-step evolutions. So it's, again, something like a chain of discrete events. And we have a lot of freshly identically prepared ancillas that are interacting with the system. So the evolution of the system qubit undergoes two steps. The first step is a unitary interaction between the qubit and a fresh ancilla. And the second step is basically partial thermalization with the bar. So we assume that these interactions with the ancillas happen very shortly. And then in the waiting time until the next ancilla comes, the system qubit can just re-thermalize partially until the next one comes. Now, 
we are, to make things simple, we are assuming that we are in some kind of stroboscopic steady state already, which means that after several ancillas have passed, the system state upon application of these two steps doesn't change anymore. Yeah? So it's something like a steady state of the system. That just makes the theoretical description easy. The unitary interaction, we are also taking the simplest possible idea, which is a um, resonant exchange of energy. So all the qubits are resonant with each other, and we just let them exchange energy, which is described by a partial swap operation. And a partial swap operation described by this unitary here is basically characterized by one single parameter, which is the swap angle. <coughs> it's interaction strength times interaction time. And if the swap angle is pi half, we have a full swap of the qubit states. If it's very small, then we have a weak interaction and so on. For the thermalization in between, we are going to use a standard master equation. We're just assuming that the system qubit is weakly coupled to a bosonic bond. Yeah, and then we can use the standard quantum optical master equation to describe thermalization in a bosonic bar where the temperature enters through the average occupation number of the bar at the qubit frequency. And then we have an interaction strength, which is again given by the time we allow this to re thermalize times some interaction rate. If this is very small, then the system will barely re thermalize. If this is very large here, this number then the system will go to a thermal equilibrium state and we are in the equilibrium benchmark. And then, well, where's the information encoded? After collecting, let's say, n ancillas that have interacted, we can take the reduced quantum state of these n ancillas by tracing over the system, and that quantum state contains the information about temperature that we care about. Sorry, then rho is rho s. Uh, yeah, we trace over s in this case. No, uh, yeah, but I was thinking, uh, one line above, yeah. rho is rho s or? Oh, yes, yes, this would be rho s. Okay, okay. Okay, good. All right, so let's let's look at an example. Here we have, um, we're looking at how much information we get from single ancilla measurement. So every ancilla after it is interacted, we immediately measure it. Yeah, and then we, we do that many, many times. And after many copies, we ask how good is our accurate, uh, our, our, how accurate is our estimator of temperature? after collecting many repetitions. This can be quantified by the so-called Fisher information, or quantum Fisher information, which is a quantity that describes how much information is in a quantum state about a parameter, yeah? which we can compute for any qubit state, let's say. And why is the Fisher information relevant? Well, because there is the so-called uh, quantum kramer rao bond that tells us that an unbiased estimator of temperature, the uncertainty of that estimator is lower bounded by one over the square root of this quantum Fisher information. So this gives us a, a basically a best bound on the accuracy of our measurement. Now, in the case of the equilibrium benchmark, when our probes are fully thermalized, we can actually compute this analytically. That's the so-called thermal Fisher information, and it has a very intuitive form. It's just given by the heat capacity of our probe divided by kVt squared. And that's kind of intuitive. You can say, if, if I have a higher heat capacity of my probe, I get more information, uh, I get a more accurate estimate. Because I have more degrees of freedom, so to say, or yeah, basically I'm more sensitive to temperature. Now, what we see here is our collisional thermometer for some ground state ancillas that we prepare, moderate temperature, and we plot now the information we get from single ancilla measurements relative to the benchmark, and we plot it as a function of the thermalization time in between subsequent ancillas and uh, the interaction strength with each ancilla given by the swap angle. And what we see is that we can beat the equilibrium benchmark in this window here, which is at small thermalization times smaller than one in this kind of dimensionless units and close to full swap swap angles. And in this case, it goes up to four times the thermal pressure information, but that depends on the temperature. That is a relatively strong coupling, right? Because it yes, it's a strong coupling. Yeah. So the usual question. Uh, can you forget about uh, the, the counter rotating curves? Uh, uh, well, it's strong. Well, our it depends what we mean strong. And in this case, we actually do not have um, the. So, in this case, you are still have the freedom to choose what you mean by strong. It can either be a strong coupling or a short or a longer interaction time. It's always relative to the, the coupling to the bar. Right. But what is the, the usual story is that. Which is 
in yes. Bao should be smaller than zero one to use the gene scanning. Uh, well, no, but we have uh, the, the the frequency of the qubit is not entering here. Actually, this can be even much higher. Ah, I see. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. So the moral of the story is we find here that the sensitivity goes beyond the benchmark. And the reason for that is that we are actually out of equilibrium. And the intuition here is the system is driven out of equilibrium and tries to re-thermalize every time after one interaction. And this re-thermalization is carried out with a, with a finite time scale. And this relaxation time, this effective relaxation time depends on temperature as well. So what we are probing here is not just the average energy at a given temperature, but also the relaxation rate. And that gives us, in this case, more information about temperature. Okay, we did more analysis about this. For example, we also looked at what you can extract from multiple ancillas at the same time, so collective measurements on ancillas. It turns out that in some regimes of actually very bad measurements, you can use quantum correlations to enhance your sensitivity. But I'm not going to show this. I want to move on, so I'll just mention it briefly. We now actually study thermometry further and go a little bit more into the details of how to do thermometry with finite data sets. So really like doing it like you would do it in the lab where you collect a finite amount of data and try to ask how well can you estimate temperature from finite data sets. <coughs> All these Fisher information descriptions are usually asymptotic descriptions and we are also now trying to understand what happens if you actually have poor data for example. This new analysis has allowed us for instance to understand how uh, this enhanced sensitivity can be understood. Because you can ask yourself the question, well, if it's true that I, I just don't let things thermalize fully, which means that I basically stop my equilibration prematurely, how can it be that I'm getting better in my measurement if I kind of not let full information propagate to my tubes? Well, you can understand it as a kind of trade-off. And this is something we looked at here. So here what you see is the range of temperatures that our thermometer is sensitive to given a finite data set, 500 qubits in this case, and full swap. And we plot, we compute this range by doing a relative entropy argument. We say, okay, what's the lowest temperature that we can still distinguish from zero temperature given 500 qubits? And by barely distinguish, I mean by at least one bit of information. And what's the highest temperature we can barely distinguish from infinite temperature? This we can compute using relative entropies, and this gives us a range of temperatures that we are sensible to. So sensible. To. And if you plot this range of temperatures as a function of the thermalization time in between the interactions, you will find that actually, as we go down, so we are out, out of equilibrium, we are less sensitive to lower temperatures, which makes sense. But the good thing is we increase the range of temperatures that we are sensitive to. So that's a good thing. However, the trade-off is that the best possible resolution locally that we can get at the optimal temperature will always go down when we go to non-equilibrium, okay? So the, the sensitivity is always best at equilibrium. Now, how come we can still see a sensitivity enhancement? Well, this is the best sensitivity at the optimal temperature. However, when you do thermometry at the beginning, you don't know the temperature. So in many cases, you will not be at the optimal temperature given your thermometer. And if you're not at the optimal temperature, you might profit from the fact that you're sensitive to a larger range of temperatures and therefore at non-equilibrium, you can have higher sensitivities. That's how you can understand this. Now this research is going on at the moment and we're looking at Bayesian approaches of uh, finite data analysis. This is a PhD project by Julia Buyens in Siegen. And the idea is here to really set up a fully Bayesian parameter estimation framework where we have some an informed prior that we set up, we describe optimal estimators using the Bayesian framework. We are trying to use maybe a few reusable probes, maybe only one that we reuse and recycle in our, in our protocol. We can use weak measurements and so on. And this, of course, the goal of this. We have a question from the oh, yes. audience. Okay. Uh, Dilip, please go. Yeah. yeah. So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I have just a very stupid, maybe uh, stupid question, but yeah. So what about like, uh, I mean, the temperature of like uh, the ancilla? For example, like you have to be a very ideal situation. For example, all the ancilla have to be in isolated uh, stuff, or like what about the temperature effect of this ancilla? Uh, there could be some temperature for the ancilla system, right? I mean, 
Yes, so we are assuming at the moment, or in this, in this uh, what I showed before, we have assumed that we can prepare the ancillas in the ground state, for example, yeah? which is, of course, in practice, not true. And in, did, in, yeah. fact, in, in, in fact, the, the kind of analysis we're doing now, this Bayesian analysis, the idea is to use, to really reuse a probe after it has interacted with the bot and explicitly apply reset operations or other things to, to yeah. have a more realistic description of what's going on with the ancilla. Yeah, yeah, that's what my, that's what my second question. For example, like you have not taken into account the interaction between these ancillas, right? I mean, uh, uh, in general, well, it could be. Yes. Well, then that doesn't have to be an interaction, right? It depends, really. I mean, you could do this, but uh, you would. That, that's also another follow-up thing that we're looking at. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. So so far, we have independent measurements, but of course, if you send in probes that are actually interacting with the contact system one after the other, then they get correlated via this, actually. And this you need to take this into account. But of course, the ultimate goal here in this case would be to have a fully autonomous measuring agent that is actually sending in probes and collecting data, and based on the acquired data, adaptively changes the measurement strategy to get the highest possible accuracy um, in the quickest amount of time, so to say. Yeah. This is the goal of this project. All right, and let me stop here and move on to the second application, which is quantum metrics. So this is actually work that, uh, well, also is done here in Dijon. So there's, there's the connection here. That's also why I'm here. And uh, we have done some work here looking at quantum charging protocols for quantum batteries and the use of coherence to get an advantage in charging power. OK, so what we are interested in are genuinely fully quantum models, kind of autonomous or self-contained quantum models for the charging of a quantum battery, which means that we do not want to have classical control fields or classical resources um, here, but we want to describe all the resources, all the charges transferred to the battery by quantum systems, carried by quantum systems, and have a full quantum protocol of this. Yeah? So in a sense, this is complementary to all the literature that is out there, where typically classical fields are used to charge a quantum system with useful energy. So what is our quantum battery? Well, we are following the convention of using something like a ladder model, a uniform ladder model for a battery. So we have a large quantum system with uniform energy levels. So all of them are basically by the same energy unit apart, which is the energy unit E. And this shall be our battery. Now the question is, what is the battery charge? Well, it's of course energy, but all of the energy? No, because if we just heat up a battery, we would also increase its energy, but that is not useful. That is not actually useful <coughs> energy that we can use to do work, for instance. Yeah? So we need a measure for the amount of useful energy. And the typical measure that one can use here is the so-called agotropy, which is a formally defined quantity that is given by the energy, the maximum of energy that I can extract from the battery state, given the battery Hamiltonian, by applying a unitary. So I optimize over the unitary that I apply to the battery, and I see how much can I change the, the, the energy. So this is, in a sense, an ideal upper bound for how much I can extract in an isentropic cyclic protocol, so to say. It's also an upper bound for isothermal work extraction, because for isothermal work extraction, the best I can do is the free energy, equilibrium free energy difference that gives me the reversible work that I can extract. And that is also upper bounded by agot. So that's a useful point. Now, what is the resource of charge that we provide to the battery? Well, we're providing the, 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 the charge now in units of qubits. So qubits shall be the carrier of charge, in this case, agotropy, which we allow to be transferred to the battery. When does a qubit have charge? When does a qubit have agotropy? One of two things has to be um, available. It's either population inversion, meaning that the qubit has to be with a higher probability in the excited state and in the ground state, and or it has to have a coherence between the energy levels. These are the two options to have ergonomic unity. So we're assuming we're coming in with qubit states with a finite amount of ergonomic. And the transfer, again, is described by a resonant exchange of energy. So again, we're using the fact that the qubits have the same energy as the battery. We're assuming this. And we are describing this now by a unitary that is something like a generalized partial swap. So what we are using is the we are introducing a ladder operator A, 
which just describes the removal of one unit of energy from the battery. This ladder operator is at this point not yet fully specified. We just allow this to have any level dependent rate. And then we kind of combine this with the conjugate ladder operator on the qubit and take the Hermitian conjugate. And this defines our resonant transfer unit. And by that, we again have one of those repeated interaction models with a Markov chain, discrete Markov chain that describes the update of the battery state as we go, as we provide one qubit after the other, right? We take a qubit, take the battery state, tensor them, apply the unitary, trace over the qubit to get the battery state at the next step, and this is how we proceed. The little detail is that, as I will show later, we can allow now the protocol to be adaptive in that we are allowing the interaction time with each qubit to change as we go in the protocol. Okay, we will see later what this means. Okay, now how to mathematically describe this? Well, we can now expand this partial trace in the states of the qubit to actually get something like a master equation description for this protocol. This becomes a little bit technical here, but basically if we take the partial matrix elements of the unitary, we see what kind of operators we are going to get. One operator is these, are these charge lowering and raising operators here, which are these matrix elements. And they are basically given analytically by the ladder operator of the battery times a rate that is diagonal in the battery uh, energy levels, which tells us something about how much, uh, what is the rate at the current level that I'm in. And then there are energy diagonal operators, which are these partial matrix elements, which actually will lead to the phase. Plugging everything in, we can write down something like a master equation, a discrete time step master equation for the change of the battery state upon each charge step. And here we see the master equation that you get if you come in with incoherent qubits, so just population inverted qubits. In that case, you can understand the Markov chain as a biased random walk across the energy ladder in combination with dephasing across the energy ladder. So you have these dissipators here, which are the typical uh, Lindblad dissipators with the charge raising lowering operator. We have a bias given by the population version, and then we also have the phasing. So any additional coherences in the battery state will decay. If we go into the coherent case, it actually becomes more interesting. However, the master equation is not really doesn't really tell us any intuitive features. What we see is we get two dissipators, and the Lindblad operators in there are now linear combinations of charge raising, lowering, and dephasing operators. However, it turns out that this is now capable of producing energy coherences in the battery. We will see what this brings us. Before I go into the examples, let me just quickly show you which kind of batteries we studied, because so far I haven't actually specified the ladder operator. The first one we studied, and our first um, work on this, is a uniform ladder operator where we assume that we can remove one unit of charge from the battery at a level independent rate. So it's basically something like a generalization of the qubit ladder operator. Now, this is something you typically do not have in the lab freely available. Um, but it is actually, it does exist, and people try to actually implement this in iron traps. It's known as an arith arithmetic operation and was discussed when people try to implement quantum uh, computing protocols, quantum gates with iron traps, uh, trap ions. And um, if you use this ladder operator in the coherent charging protocol, you are getting features of a quantum random walk, as I will show you. So that's one possibility, but then what is more easily available in the lab would be a harmonic oscillator battery. Yeah? In that case, you're using a bosonic ladder operator with this square root of a level dependent rate. And this has direct experimental uh, platforms available. For example, the micromaser that is also studied here, where we have a cavity field that is driven by coherent atoms, two level atoms that are sent through the cavity one by one and can basically drive the cavity field. Yeah. But one can also, of course, use a large spin instead of a harmonic oscillator, in which case one would have a spin ladder operator instead of a Yes? I have a question. Here in the harmonic oscillator, take again, take energy, yeah? Yes. But for previous case, A dagger A, what does it be A dagger? A dagger A in the previous case would just be identity minus uh, the ground state. So it's basically a projector on everything except for the ground state. But you can still define energy by, by basically defining the number operator. It just means that A dagger A is not the number operator. Okay. 
So the large spin battery actually would also be experimentally available. For instance, one can use magnetic degrees of freedom coupled to circuit QED qubits to charge them, for example. All right, let me look at it. Let's look at an example. Here's a random walk battery. And uh, we, we just provide charge qubits of a fixed population inversion of 25% ground state probability. We are using a charge, uh, a charge interaction time that corresponds to a half swap by fourth. And we are having, we're studying here a, a battery with 200 energy levels. Okay. And what we look at here is the energy distribution on the battery as we count up the number of qubits that we charge with in terms of hundreds. We start from an initially partially charged battery, just to see what happens, and we compare incoherent charging with population inverted qubits with this population version versus coherent charging where we have pure states of the same population. What we see now is the black curve is the incoherent case. We see the typical features of a biased random walk. Immediately we get a Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian distribution spreads and moves up with the energy ladder, charges the battery until we hit the upper level, it will then saturate and reach the maximum charge state. That's it. Now, interestingly, what happens in the quantum case, we get this typical quantum random walk features of a bimodal distribution and some interference fringes here. And we find that this forward peak of the bimodal distribution actually moves faster upward the energy level, charges up the battery faster. However, there's a backward peak that discharges the battery. So if you take both of them together, you find that's actually worse than the classical case. Yeah, so that doesn't work. And it's even worse because once you actually hit the upper charge level, it doesn't stop there. It gets reflected and discharges the battery even more. Yeah? But it becomes interesting if we now start from an empty battery. Because in an empty battery, which is a random walk starting basically at one end of your chain, then you only get the forward peak in the quantum case. The backward peak is basically just suppressed. It doesn't happen anymore. And that forward peak moves faster than the classic. So you have a charging power now that is higher, or charging speed that is higher than in the incoherent case, at least until you reach that point, because then you get a reflection. So what you would have to do is you would have to stop here and switch to the incoherent protocol. Something that they never uh, properly, I mean, the, the upper bound is just a numerical artifact, or is it? No, we assume that our battery only has 200 levels. So we're assuming a final. Okay, I always think in terms of the microlaser where this infinite. No, in a, in a harmonic oscillator, you don't have now. Right. That's okay, but in this ion perhaps you have. Them. Yeah, like if you have a chain like this and you could actually implement these kind of ladder operators, you would have an upper. Okay. And we also wanted to study what happens with finite batteries when you have something like a full charge state. All right, so that's interesting. We can actually look at this in a bit more detail. Here you have the energy of the battery as a function of the number of charge qubits. You see the same thing. The black solid line is the incoherent one. It's just linearly charging up at a, basically a constant power until we saturate at the maximum, that's it. Now, is all of that energy useful energy? Almost the dashed solid, the dashed black line is the agotropy, which is almost as high as the energy. And in the end saturates as well. And in the quantum case, we find that we just have a higher slope here. And we charge faster until we get to that turning point. And again, most of the energy is agotropy. And in fact, most of the agotropy is in population inversion. The dotted line would be the agotropy of the defaced cavity uh, battery state, which would be the energy that is only in population inversion. And you see, most of it is in the dot. All right. We did more analysis on this random walk battery, so please check our publication if you're interested. We looked at efficiency. We also showed that quantum protocols can beat the best classical protocol always, so there is always a quantum advantage. But now I want to quickly also mention the harmonic oscillator battery, the micro maser that was also studied. In this case, you have an incoherent random walk, uh, and uh, sorry, you have a random walk with these level dependent rates because you have the bosonic ladder operator which makes also the classical version behave differently uh, in incoherent charging. But now we try to, to up the ante a little bit and make the challenge for the quantum protocol bigger by assuming that we can design the best classical protocol by adapting our charging times with each qubit to get the maximum power. How do we get maximum power? Well, first of all, we need to use fully population inverted qubits. Yeah? And then we need to adapt the charging times 
as we go, like one over the square root of the number of qubits we used already. And then, so, so that means that you don't have coherence in the qubits. Or the incoherence, no, no. Well, ah, yeah, so this is just the okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. And we, we changed the charging time now, like one over the square root of the number of qubits we used already. The reason for that is we want to match the square root change of the level dependent rate to always get optimum energy transfer. So this is what you need for optimal charging power. And so doing some clever math, which you can find in our, in our preprint, uh, we can actually show that we find a non tight upper bound for the average charging power in this case, in this adaptive protocol, which is energy or ergotropy in units of the battery energy level spacing divided by charging time, which is the sum of the individual charging times, all dimensionless, is given by a simple nonlinear expression, uh, linear expression. That's a non tight classical upper bound of the best possible classical protocols. And it turns out that quantum protocols, even non adaptive quantum protocols, can beat this upper bound. And actually, the way you beat it is the most boring possible way you can imagine, which is you go into the limit of continuous driving, meaning that you're using coherent superposition qubits plus state qubits. You're going to the limit where each qubit interacts only for a very, very small time. And in that infinitesimal time limit, you can show that the master equation for the charging process reduces to a simple driving Hamiltonian of your cavity. So you're just doing coherent driving of your cavity. And that turns out to be the optimal non adaptive protocol to charge your battery, which is a little bit boring in a way, but it's good to, to see that this already beats the best classical incoherent bound. We can show that this charging power is given by this, and this is up to 90% higher in power than the non tight upper bond in the classical case. Here's just a plot where you can see this in practice. We looked at a battery here um, as a function of charging time, the average energy of the battery. The dotted blue line would be the driving limit, the best quantum non adaptive limit. The blue lines are for a finite amount of interaction time, which kind of approach the dotted line as you go closer to zero charging time. And the dashed black line and the shaded area is this non tight classical bond, which we can beat if we are sufficiently small in the charging times, close to the driving limit. The solid black line, by the way, is a numerically optimized greedy algorithm that tries to optimize the incoherent charging power as much as possible in each step. And you see that it actually does not reach our bond. So it's a non tight bond. All right. Can this be done in practice? Well, we looked at available data for one micromaser center, which was the one that was done in Serge Haroche's group in Paris, in which case what they could do is they could send in Rydberg atoms into a microwave cavity, and the Rydberg atoms, they could send them in at 80 microseconds repetition time, so that would be the time uh, for, uh, of repetition for ancilla after ancilla, so kind of the charging time window. But now we have to include the fact that the cavity has a finite lifetime, so charge is actually leaking out of the cavity at the same time. The cavity lifetime in this case is actually pretty good. It's 65 milliseconds, which means we have a three orders of magnitude better time uh, for the repetition time. However, that's barely enough to still see our advantage. If we want to include this in our model, we basically just have to include the damping channel in between two charging steps. Right? We can do this in our model. And for this particular numbers, you find 0.13% single proton loss probability in between two charge steps. However, the problem is, if it's a little bit higher than that, you already lose your quantum advantage. It turns out that if you go to 0.2% or higher single photon loss probabilities, the quantum advantage will be gone already. So it's very sensitive to this, and it's barely visible. And if you want to know more about this micromaser stuff, of course, there's also the work done in the John, which looks at slightly different applications. Here's just uh, the curve that we showed for 0.1 photon loss probability. The blue curve barely goes over the uh, classical bound. So you see that you can beat it, but it takes longer and it's, yeah, it's not as good. Okay, this I just want to flash it very quickly. We're also looking at entanglement in batteries right now, but not so much into improving charging by entanglement, but we're trying to use battery work fluctuations that we measure in a battery by trying to extract work by local random control operations. And we use the fluctuations of work that we measure there to detect entanglement. So if we have a battery that we can buy partition into two parts, and we have an interaction between these two parts, for instance, you have a spin chain, you divide it into two halves, 
you have some entangled battery state, you can actually characterize how high dimensional the entanglement is by the so-called Schmidt number, which is one measure of dimensionality of entanglement. And it turns out that you can actually detect the Schmidt number by observing the fluctuating work that you get when you try to extract work using only local operations on the two halves of the battery. So assuming that we have completely uniformly random operations that we apply to extract work or put work into the battery because it's going to be random, we get noisy, basically, energy fluctuations. We can detect them in the protocol by doing a two-point measurement. And if we do this, we could show that there are certain thresholds. If the work fluctuation is beyond a certain threshold, you can conclude that your Schmidt number is higher than a certain integer value, which means that you can detect entanglement and dimensionality. Of entanglement. Now, whether this is useful in any form, we don't know yet. Typically, I would say in quantum thermodynamics, the answer is no. But at least it's an interesting phenomenon that uh, we were studying here and we'll see what we can do. Last but not least, very, very shortly, I will quickly mention demons. Okay? Measurement-driven engines. What is a measurement-driven engine or a Maxwell demon? A Maxwell demon is essentially a protocol that takes a working medium that can get thermally excited by a heat. And by doing a measurement and a feedback operation, we can convert this heat into work and store it, for instance, in a battery. That's basically in modern language what a Maxwell demon engine is. What we wanted to do is we wanted to implement such a demon with a macroscopic agent in the lab and via an indirect pointer measurement using a mechanical pointer to understand the cost of measurement and all these second law questions and so on. So the model that we study is a self-contained model of a measurement-driven engine, which in which we, our working medium is a qubit that couples to a hot bath, can get excited by a hot bath. And in order to detect the excitation of the qubit and extract it as work, we couple the qubit to a pointer, which we describe by a harmonic oscillator, a mechanical pointer that is strongly coupled to the qubit in such a way that it changes its equilibrium position depending on the qubit state. Right? So that basically tells us that if the qubit is in the ground state, the pointer points to that side. If the qubit is in the excited state, it points to that side. Now, in order for this to work like a pointer, we need a damping channel. Because if we don't have damping, it's just a harmonic oscillator. If the qubit state changes, the pointer will just oscillate. You kick the pointer. So in order to make sure that the pointer assumes a new equilibrium value, we need damping at the point. So we need to include a cold bath into the system that damps the point. And then how do we do the measurement feedback? Well, this will be our lazy demon, essentially. Why lazy? Because we are not trying to assume that we have a thermodynamic cycle where the demon is doing something at precisely a given time. But in fact, the demon can be somebody in the lab who just randomly checks at some time, where is my pointer? Is it pointing left or right? And if it's pointing left, let me apply a Rabi flip operation to extract my energy because I know that my qubit is excited. This is the point, then this is basically the demon, okay? Now, let us compare this quickly to an ideal demon that people study in the literature right now. In that case, typically, people assume that you have direct access to the quantum system and you can do projective measurements onto the quantum system directly and then apply control operation based on your result. But in this ideal demon setups, we typically assume that the demon has a memory, which we also describe by a quantum system, and when we get the measurement result, we need to update the memory of the demon. And then after one cycle, we need to erase the memory of the demon. Why do we need to do this? Because otherwise the second law would be broken in this idealized description. This is Landauer's famous Landauer principle. In this case here, we do not need to do this because we have now a mechanical pointer that is taking care of all this. And somebody sitting in the lab, the memory of that person does not matter. Obviously, it would be strange for physics if we had to include the memory of that person to be consistent with the second law. All right, now this is a, the technical again, I just want to brush over it. We can write down a simple master equation model for this system. Basically, what I described is a spin boson model where you have a spin here and you have a harmonic oscillator whose equilibrium position depends on the spin state. We can add thermal couplings to the hot part and to the cold part using standard von Markov theory with some coupling rates. We need to make sure that the coupling rates have a certain hierarchy of strengths. Simply, we need to be in the resolved sideband regime. 
that's the technical term for in optical mechanics, meaning that the qubit frequency needs to be the largest, then the oscillator frequency, then the pointer reaction time, uh, the rate, and then the excitation rate of the qubit. Yeah? Basically, we want to make sure that the pointer can react quickly to any change in the qubit state. That's important. In this case, without the measurement, we can write down the steady state of the system, which is essentially just a mixture of qubit excited and thermal state of the pointer on the left. And the other part of the mixture is qubit in the ground state and thermal state of the pointer on the right. And the, the mixing ratio is given by the thermal occupation of the qubit. The hot bar. Very simple. Now we add the demon. It's a lazy active demon. We said that we just want to randomly check occasionally where the pointer is, which we describe by a Poisson process with an average rate gamma, which has to be smaller than the pointer reaction rate, obviously. And then we're going to introduce here, in this case, a dichotomic projective measurement simply saying, is the pointer left or not? If the pointer is left, let's apply a Rabi flip. If the pointer is right, let's not do anything. Okay? Very simple. From this, we can extract an average output power that we can extract by doing this Rabi flip. And we can compute this and study basically the steady state behavior of this power in this model. There can be an even lazier demon. So what if that person is so lazy that they decide to go home? Well, what they can do is they can just switch on a weak control field. And this weak control field is, done, is, is designed in such a way that it only resonantly interacts with our working medium when it's on the left. Okay. Only then the interaction will be resonant. And then, because the qubit is then excited, we are always going to rotate the qubit to the ground state and extract energy by this, yeah, formally at least. So, this would also constitute work extraction formally. And we can also give a work extraction power given a weak control field. Okay, that's basically the model. And just to remind you, compared to this ideal demon, we do not need to care about lambda or erasure anymore because the second law holds regardless of the memory of the person in the lab. Yeah? Because it's taken care of by the damping of the pointer. The pointer is a damped system, which means that we have basically memory loss after the pointer has moved to the new position, simply because of the damping of the pointer. Yeah? It doesn't oscillate anymore after some time. And the measurement energy cost is fully included in our model. Yeah? And the reason for that is that I mean, at least the measurement energy cost for the direct pointer measurement is included. The reason for that is that due to this coupling, the energy of the qubit changes depending on the position of the pointer. So if the pointer actually points left to tell us to extract work, this actually reduces the energy of the qubit. And that means we can extract less work than the bare qubit energy. Yeah? So basically, there's a cost associated to the measurement that we're doing here with the pointer. Plus, Doing a position measurement on the pointer introduces measurement back action, which heats up the pointer, which also affects the system. This is the clue that it's not. And finally, this is just to show you that it actually works. Here we look at the output power using our model as a function of the interrogation rate of the pointer. So this would be the random rate of checking it in the case of an active demon or the weak control field strength in the case of a passive demon. The black curve is the active demon we see that we get some kind of sweet spot of maximum output power. And that sweet spot actually corresponds to an interrogation rate that is as high as the pointer can move, the speed of the movement of the pointer. Obviously, if you check too lazily, like too occasionally, then you're not extracting as much as you could. So it's going down. If you check faster than the pointer can react, then you're basically in a zero regime. You're freezing the pointer and cannot move back and forth anymore. So you also can extract work. That's why there's the sweet spot. It turns out that the efficiency of this engine is also at maximum at the same spot. And for this kind of control field demon, it's a little bit different, but we actually have to stop our calculation here because essentially here we reach the regime where the strength of the control field is not weak anymore. So the validity of our model is no longer guaranteed. But they also see some kind of sweet spot essentially. So this tells us that this engine actually operates as it should. And Nicely, we are looking here at a scenario where the average occupation at the hot bath for the qubit frequency is the same as the average occupation of the cold bath of the oscillator frequency. This is a regime. If you use that regime for a quantum auto engine, standard quantum, quantum thermal machines that people study, a quantum auto engine would not operate in this regime. 
our measurement driven engine can operate in the solution. That's actually also interesting. So it's really a different kind of engine. All right, this brings me to the end of my talk finally. So let me just conclude. We have um, studied different applications of repeated interaction models to study quantum thermal devices with small open quantum systems. Um, and I have talked about one application, which was quantum thermometry, where we used non equilibrium features to enhance sensitivity. I've talked about quantum batteries, and we saw that we can use quantum coherence in our chargers to boost charging power of a quantum battery. And finally, I've shown you kind of an interesting quantum version of an engine, which is not driven by heat, but driven by quantum measurement and feedback operations. And we can show that we can write down self contained models using mechanical pointer measurements to extract work from heat. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stefan, for this nice presentation. Uh, we are open for questions. Uh -huh. no. Olga? It's no, I think he's a clapping. Ah, it's clapping. Uh, can okay. I ask you, uh, can you, I mean, I need a, a bit more explanation about the how to measure a target. I mean, the, you, you were very fast on that bipartite uh, case. Yes, can yes. you explain it again a little bit? So, Schmidt number, okay. There's yes. the so called Schmidt rank for pure states. If you have a pure bipartite state, you know that you can always do a Schmidt decomposition. Right? Yes. And if you just count the number of non zero Schmidt coefficients, that's the so called Schmidt rank. Obviously, if it's one, it means you're not entangled, you're in the product state. Right. If it's two, you're entangled. If it's higher than two, you're also entangled, but now you can use the number higher than two to quantify the dimensionality of entanglement. If you have two d dimensional parts, the number of non zero Schmidt coefficients can be at most d. So it can be between two and three. Now, if you go to uh, mixed states, the Schmidt rank needs to be generalized using these convex uh, hoof constructions. Right? And this can be done, and then it becomes the so-called Schmidt number. And it's basically the generalization of the Schmidt rank for mixed states that tells us how high dimensional the entanglement is. It's just a generalization of an entanglement criteria. So let's see. I mean, suppose that you have uh, a cut state uh, that we give to right? Uh, yes. If you're in a higher dimensional Hilbert space, but you only just use two different states. Right. So higher is this Schmidt numbers, the more uh, you are entangled or not? No, no. Well, it depends because if you are in higher dimensional systems, uh, the question is, what does it mean to be higher entangled? Right. You can write down something like a maximally entangled state, which would be Schmidt coefficients are all of the same size, and you just have D Schmidt coefficients. Right. That would be the maximally entangled state, and that would have Schmidt number D. Okay. Okay, can you go back to what you really, I mean, okay, this is the definition of that, uh, but can you go back to what you did in the setup? So you have a a battery which is we are really assuming that we have a battery given and we have a battery state given okay. which we don't know it might be entangled and the battery also needs to be interacting so we have a battery that has two parts so we can just bipartition it into two parts and we know that there's an interaction between the two parts okay described by a hamiltonian that has basically two local terms and an interaction term. <laughs> and then we're just saying okay what we're doing now is we're trying to we are allowing the experimenter to do random local operations to extract energy. So not entangling operations. The experimenter can only address the local parts individually. Mm -hmm. And we want to study this here in, in a random setup simply because there you can actually do some clever maths and you can compute stuff analytically. So we are assuming that the unitaries we apply here are uniformly random. It's like saying that you basically have a completely uncalibrated setup. You don't know where your axis of your generalized block sphere are, essentially, if you think of spins, right? And you just apply any unitary and just monitor the change of energy. And in order to monitor the change of energy, you need to actually also describe a two point measurement. So you need to measure the energy before and after locally. And actually, it turns out that a perfect two point measurement will not be able to detect entanglement because in a perfect two-point measurement, you do a perfect projective measurement locally, you destroy all the entanglement with your first measurement. In order for this to work, you need to go to a weak measurement limit. But we didn't use standard weak measurements, we used noisy projective measurements. 
which is a kind of a, a nice discrete approach for weak measurements. And that is our protocol essentially. Then we just measure work and then we look at the variance of the change in energy over a big sample of random unitaries. And that variance fulfills certain bound given by the Schmidt number. If you break that, if you violate that bound, you know that your Schmidt number is larger than that special value. It's actually very technical, very complicated, but you can prove that these bonds are. So it's a way to measure the entanglement of the event. Exactly. Yes. By something as, as uh, let's say, intuitive as work fluctuations. But to be true, it doesn't need to, you don't need to phrase it in this thermodynamic framework. You could also say, well, I could use a different observable than energy. Then it wouldn't be thermodynamic in a way. But we use this because we think it's kind of an intuitive way of understanding uh, the system and having a nice intuitive picture of what we are measuring in this case. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Seems not. So in this case, uh, let us thank Stefan again. Thank you. And thank you all for joining for we did some complete our